huge chunk this morning. We're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 19. And as you're uh, turning there, I told my wife I didn't have a, a title for this sermon this morning, but I actually did. I forgot about it. Uh, the title of this morning's sermon would be The Beauty of God's Providence. And providence, like God's sovereignty, is one of those things that for us as believers, uh, sometimes that's a, that's a hard thing to swallow. It's a hard thing to understand, especially when we are looking at difficulties and, and trials and persecutions and tribulations in our life. And I'll say something this morning and right here at the very beginning that uh, you might kind of question at first, but I really want you to think about what I say. All men and women and children are untouchable and immortal until the Lord of all creation, by His divine sovereignty, through His providence, gives a nod of assent for anything to happen to me. And I want to repeat that because I think that's very important that we, that we understand this. All men and women are untouchable and immortal until the Lord of all creation, by His divine sovereignty, through providence, gives a nod of assent for anything to happen to them. His will will not be trumped or thwarted or opposed by anything or by anyone. What God ordains in our lives, no one can alter. And what He does not ordain in our lives, none can contrive or perform that task. Though Satan and the hosts of his demonic underlings try as they may, they are powerless without God's assent to anything in our lives. We remember back in Job. If you want to turn there, turn there back to Job chapter 1 and 2. We see something very interesting. God honors his man Job and Satan comes to the Lord and says, Lord, if you will just take your hand away from him and let me put my hand upon him, Job will, Job will deny you. And we see it in chapter 1, verse 8. It says, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there, Job, that there is none like him on, on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out. From, his pre from the presence of the Lord. And we know what happens to Job at that point. And it's again in chapter 2 that Satan says, and the Lord, or the Lord says, and the Lord said to Satan, have you, not have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life, but stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. And we see that, again, Job suffers under Satan's hand, but only at the ascent of God. We look at another instance with Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 22 and starting in verse 19. 1 Kings chapter 22 and, verses 19, and starting in verse 19. The Lord has 
condemned Ahab. He's condemned the false prophet Ahab. And they finally, finally, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, and Ahab consult the true prophet of God, Micaiah. And in verse 19 it says, And Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the hosts of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said one thing, and another said another. And then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord, saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, By what means? And he said, I will go out, and will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, You are to entice him. And you shall succeed. Go out and do so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouths of all your prophets. The Lord has declared disaster for you. God's providence put Micaiah in that place at that time to perform God's will in the life of Jehoshaphat and Ahab. And i got to tell you, a lightning bolt will not singe one hair upon your head. Not one bone will be broken in a car accident. There will be no blocked coronary arteries in your heart. A thief's knife will not penetrate one skin cell unless God and his providence has ordained it. But let us, at the same time, also be wise, not carefree, not foolish, and thinking that no harm will ever befall us. I'm sure Absalom never thought his hair would get stuck in an oak tree and he would be thrust through with a spear. Nor did Samson think his hair would be cut. Nor did Ahab think he would die from a random arrow shot into the space just between his armor and his breastplate. It's God's providence. That ordains these things. But that should bring a great comfort to the Christian's heart. Augustine says this, he said, Trust the past to God's mercy, the present to God's love, and the future to God's providence. And I really do believe what the Apostle Paul wrote in chapter 8 of Romans. In verses 33 through 39, when he says this, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised from, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written for your sake? We are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to pay, things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing is going to happen to you whatsoever outside of God's providence. And I know that is so hard for us to hear sometimes. I sat and listened to my wife and her sisters talk about the child. And some of the things they went through with his children. Oh God, you mean he ordained that? He ordained some of the things that have happened in your life? He, that, that's all in his providence? That's hard for us to swallow sometimes. That's, that, that's just like rubbing the cats for the wrong way. That, that's like taking a big old chunk of lemon and squirting it in your mouth and saying, suck it up, big boy, it tastes good. No, it doesn't. God's providence in our lives, His sovereignty is hard. It's so hard sometimes. But I believe what He said in Romans. We see how beautifully God's providence is played out in 1 Samuel chapter 19. 
God has a specific plan for David's life that will not be changed at all. And yet we look at what, what David goes through with Saul and we're going, how is that even possible? That God's providence is good because God's providence through all these events in David's life are going to put David on the throne of Israel. Praise God. The seed would come from him. The Messiah would come from his bloodline. <clears throat> and God uses specific people and places to bring this about in our text this morning. We're going to see three things in our text. God's providence in a good friend. Then we're going to see God's providence in a not-so-faithful wife. And then lastly, God's providence in a in a place of refuge. So as we begin, verses 1 through 10, let's read through these. Now, now I'm going to keep saying this until I get to chapter 31, okay? Just mark it down. I'm going to say this all the way to chapter 31. Saul just never gets it. He never comes to a place where he's understanding what God is trying to do in his life. You could have etched it into a steel beam and gone all the way back and swung it and hit him right between the eyes with it, it would have been imprinted in his forehead and he still would have never got it. God is with David, but he has departed from Saul. David was safe no matter what. David's immortal in chapter 19 here. I don't know if y'all realize that. David is immortal all the way through 1 Samuel. All the way into 2 Samuel, into 1 Kings. David is immortal. Nothing is going to happen to him. No matter what. But he had wisdom and discernment also. He was trusting the Lord to lead him and guide him in every step that he took. And maybe, maybe David knew what John Calvin was talking about when Calvin said this. Calvin said... There is no erratic power or action or motion in creatures, but that they are governed by God's secret plan in such a way that nothing happens except what is knowingly and willingly decreed by God. David's good. When David walked out before Goliath, he's immortal at that point. He doesn't know it. But he's immortal at that point. Nothing was going to happen to him outside of God's will. So let's read verses 1 through 10. It says, And Saul spoke to Jonathan his son and to all his servants, that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. Therefore be on your guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hand as he struck down the Philistine, and the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then? Will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan called David, and Jonathan reported to him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. And there was war again, and David went out and fought the Philist with the Philistines and struck him with a great blow, so that they fled before him. Then a harmful spirit from the Lord come up, came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. And David was playing the lyre. And Saul sought to pin David to the wall with a spear. But he eluded Saul so that he struck the spear into the wall and David fled and escaped into the night. First, I believe what we see King Saul do is... is is a move from being covert. He's, he's secretive about wanting to kill David before chapter 9. He, he's being very covert at this point. And now, his attempts to kill David, they're just, 
I mean, before it was just deceitfulness and lying. Now he is over. He is making it very obvious what his intentions are with David. He wants David dead. And it's no secret anymore. That's why it says he calls his son and his servants that they should kill David. He just tells it out. He just throws it out there just like it is. I want him dead. No more hiding. And there's only one problem. It's not in God's plan. So no, so no matter what Saul does, he's not going to be able to harm David one bit. And because of that, God in his providential care for David has placed the perfect people in the perfect place at the perfect time. Enter Jonathan, Saul's son. He delighted much in David, as scripture just tells us. He's, a, he's, he's one of David's defenders. Not just his friend. He's going to defend David. And let's look at what, J, what Jonathan does from him in verses uh, 2 and 3. And I'm sure that Saul would have killed his own son if God's hand hadn't held him back from him. We'll see he gets even more angry with Jonathan in a couple chapters. I, I'm surprised he didn't want to kill his own son because of that friendship between David and, and, and Jonathan. And Jonathan reminds Saul of all the good that <clears throat> David has done for him. Look there in verse 4. David spoke well, or Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul. Let not the king sin against his servant because he has not sinned against you. Because his deeds have brought good to you. Why would you kill someone that has done nothing but produce good things on your behalf? He's done a lot for Saul. He's done a lot for the nation. But it, and David just adds to it then. Jonathan reminds Saul of Goliath. Hey, you have thousands of men out here on the battlefield, and only one man stood up to fight him, and it was David, your servant. Why do you want to kill him? He reminds Saul that he used to rejoice in David. Go figure that one out. <clears throat> it says right there in the text, you saw it and rejoiced. This is something not right in Saul's head. Something not right in his heart. Jonathan tells Saul that if he slays David, innocent blood will be on his hand. I don't know that any of that that Jonathan said to Saul, where Saul went, okay, you got a point here. I think it was the Spirit of God. I think it was God's providence using, using Jonathan at this point that held the hand of Saul back. And we look at Saul's response in verse 6. And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. And Saul swore as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. Providentially, there's two things that are going on here. Providentially, God is using Jonathan in this case to help defend David. And two, God is holding back the wickedness of Saul's hands. Providence is doing this. God's spirit moving upon the hearts of, of everybody involved. Jonathan even goes and brings David back to Saul. And then it seems like for a time, everything goes back to normal. He comes back. He's in his presence as before. <coughs> but verses 8 and 10, something happens. It shows that Saul hasn't changed. And this is where the point of no return comes. This is, this is the point where it's done. It's over. When he casts that spear at David again, David escapes in, in, into the night. But this is far from over. We, we still got chapters to go on what's going on. But this is the point where we never see Saul and David again engaged as servant and king. We see they have two conversations, a couple conversations a little bit later on. As David tries, has the well, as David has the opportunity to kill Saul. But he doesn't. Why? Because he's God's man. It's not in God's providence for David to kill Saul. Now let's just pause here for a moment. What if there were no Jonathan? What if there's no Jonathan there? To defend David. To stand up for David. People often say, well, God would have sent somebody else. You know, I'm not convinced of that. 
I think God's providence doesn't depend on God doing something different necessarily. You often, you often hear about when you, when you marry your wife. Well, if you hadn't married her, God would have had somebody else for you. No, I think God and His providence has that specific person for us. I, I believe God's relationships are providential in all areas of our lives. But what if there was no Jonathan? What if in this part of the story there was no one to step in and warn and advocate for David? What if there was no one to temper Saul's rage and his thirst for David's blood? David's relationship with Jonathan was providential. It happened a couple chapters back when Jonathan and him were bonded together forever. And remember, God has a bigger picture here. He is working his perfect will out in the lives of all those involved, even in the tragedy of Saul and Jonathan's death in battle at the end of the first inning. Providentially, he is working all these things out for his good. God providentially brought David and Jonathan together for such a time as this. Stop and think about that. That day, that time, those people, God's providence is working. Jonathan is providentially being used to carry out God's will and God's bigger picture. Maybe he knew it. Maybe he just, maybe he just knew. Or, or maybe he didn't. But I can tell you this. Even though in the end, Jonathan's life is taken in battle, I don't think he ever regretted God's will for his life. Because it was perfect and it accomplished God's perfect will. David didn't regret it. And God found pleasure in his will being accomplished by all those who belong to him. The next point is this. <clears throat> God's providence in a not-so-faithful wife. Now some of you, I'm going to pause for a second, some of you might be wondering why I call Michal the not so faithful wife. Because honestly, when I looked through some of the commentaries, they had that McCall is the faithful wife. And I think that you'll see why at the, at the very end of this portion of our text. But let's read verses 11 through 17. Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him, that he might kill him in the morning. But McCall, David's wife, told him, if you do not escape with your life tonight, Tomorrow you will be killed. So Michal let David down through the window, and he fled away and escaped. Michal took an image and laid it on the bed, and put a pillow of goat's hair at its head, and covered it with the clothes. And when, Saul's, and when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He's sick. Then Saul sent messengers to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed, that I may kill him. Well, he's not making any bones about it now. And when the messengers came in, behold, the image was in the bed, with the pillow of goat's hair at his head. Saul said to Michal, Why have you deceived me thus, and let my enemy go, so that he has escaped? And Michal answered <clears throat> Saul, He said to me, Let me go, why should I kill you? <clears throat> now I think it should be a little obvious as to why we don't hear much about Michal until later, and maybe why things turned out the way that they did for her. And we're going we're gonna to look at this a little bit more in a second. So David escapes by night. That's what, that's what verse 10 tells us. He escapes by night. And where does he go? He goes home. I mean, a man's home is his castle. His wife is there. This is his safe place. The enemy never comes to your home, right? But Saul's already a step ahead. Messengers, or should I say, probably more appropriately, assassins, are already dispatched to David's house. McCall even knows about it. Look at what she says there in verse 11. If you do not escape with your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. She knew that daddy wants to kill her husband. And she does what any faithful and loving and good wife should do and would do. She helps him escape 
into the night. And again, this is God providentially <clears throat> working for the entire situation. He's working it out for the glory of his much bigger picture through the life of McCall. He's using McCall providentially. And I believe she's completely clueless as to what's really going on. I don't think she has any idea what the big picture is concerning David and the Messiah that's to come from his, from his loins. And we also see that she has some of her father, King Saul, in it. She can be deceitful and lying. And wait a second, it gets even better. She has an idol in her house. Think about it. Would David have put up with an idol being in his home? I don't think David knew about this idol that she put in the bed. So she puts essentially a dummy or a mock-up of David in the bed, that image, that idol, all the way up to his head, and it's covered with goats here, lies and says David is sick in bed. Now God did not, and let, let's just make clarify this, God did not need her to lie or be deceitful about David's whereabouts. Remember, nothing's going to happen to David at this point. God would have kept David hidden and safe somehow, some way. She didn't have to lie. Remember, David's immortal at this point. He doesn't know it, but he is. McCall may have been just trying to buy David some more time, which I'm, I'm kind of doubtful of that. She might have been trying to save some time put, so David could put a little bit more distance between himself and Saul's uh, assassins. The messengers come and she tells them, oh, David's sick. They leave, they come back with Saul's command, bring him up to me. Bring him in the bed. I want to kill him. And, and then the jig is up. It's all a lie. The liar Saul gets lied to, and he's mad. But I hope you notice this uh, when, when reading verse 17. Saul feels betrayed. He feels deceived by McCall. She let his enemy escape. And, the, and this is where things go a little catawampus for McCall. Look at what she tells Daddy at the very end of verse 17. This fired me up. This gets me mad. Verse 17, and, my, and McCall answered Saul, He said to me, let me go, or I, uh, why should I kill you? Where did that come out of David's mouth at all? Why should I kill you? David didn't say that. Now, now and this is what I'm saying. She's really not so faithful as we think. She protected him. She may have bought him a little bit of time. But she lied about David. She had been his defender earlier, lying and being deceitful to keep her father from killing him, and now she's throwing him under the bus. I mean, what would we do, man, if our daughter said, he said he was going to kill me. Well, I'd be up, man. Y'all know me. I'm like, let's go. You, you going to threaten my daughter? I'll be fired up. That probably was just like gasoline on a fire for Saul. Oh, my enemy's now saying he wants to kill her? Oh, this is, this is, we're throwing down on this one. <clears throat> she is calling David's very character and integrity and honor as a godly man into question. She is lying to cover up her, her other lie and her other deceit. She is a lying woman and all at David's expense. So do you see now why I call her the not-so-faithful wife? God, yes, he is providentially using McCall and her words and her actions and her position in keeping David safe. I mean, come on, guys. We think that we can depend on our friends to keep us safe. And if, and if we're honest, most of us, I'm not going to say all of us because I don't know, but... We would depend on our wives to be faithful and to help keep us safe and to guard us and watch our character and integrity and our honor. 
Just like we should be for them. Things are not always what they seem in the story, are they? I believe, as we, as we see later uh, in 1 Samuel, Michal will have a lot of anger and a lot of regrets. God and his providence in David's life and Saul's life and Jonathan's life and Michal's life, this is no mistake. This is no coincidence. This is no accident. This is, this is no just luck. It's not karma. This is God working in his providence in the lives of these people. Lastly, God's providence in a place of refuge. Verses 18 through 24. <clears throat> no one, uh, now, now one, this is one last example in our text of God's providence before we go into some practical application. Verse 18. Now David fled and escaped, and he came to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went <clears throat> and lived at Naoth. And it was told Saul, Behold, David is at Naoth in Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of prophets prophesying, and Samuel standing as the head over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul. And they also prophesied. When it was told Saul, he sent other messengers. And they also prophesied. And Saul sent messengers again the third time. And they also prophesied. Then he himself went to Ramah and came to the great well that, that is in Seku. And he asked, where are Samuel and David? And one said, behold, they are at Naoth and Ramah. And he went there to Naoth and Ramah. And the Spirit of God came upon him also. And as he went, he prophesied and he, until he came to Naoth and Ramah. And he too stripped off his clothes. And he, and he too prophesied before Samuel and lay naked all that day and night. Thus it is said, is Saul also among the prophets? There's a lot of stuff going on in these verses. But we want to focus now on what God is bringing to pass by his providence. David escapes Saul's clutch. And by the Holy Spirit and God's providence, where does David end up? He ends up in Ramah. Well, who's in Ramah? The prophet Samuel, the one that Saul will now have nothing to do with. Who Saul tried and tried and pleaded to, to, to Saul. And Saul turned a deaf ear to him. This is no mistake. This is not coincidence. God leads him to the one place where he will find safety at this point. And the one man who can give godly counsel. The one who had anointed him as king. And Samuel further takes David to Naoth, where there's a school of prophets that resides. And, that, and as you and, and, and as and you already know that Saul is on his heels. He's sending messengers to take him. Hear how that's put. Before, when he went to the house, he sent them to kill him. But now he's at Ramah with Samuel, and suddenly it changes not to kill him but to take him there and to bring him back to Saul. He wasn't going to kill David with Samuel being there. Saul, for once, used his brain here. More than likely, he was, like I said, he was going to bring him back for execution. When the messengers get there, the prophets are prophesying, and, and the messengers join in. The ones who were sent to get David, all of a sudden they join in and prophesying. And this prophesying was more than likely the singing of songs and praising of God. And maybe, we're, the commentators are kind of split on this, they may have been even prophesying from the word of God about David becoming the king. Or they may have just been prophesying in that they were foretelling God's words that are already written. Abarbanal says they were speaking the words of God as to David becoming king king in the future. Three times this happens. Then Saul says, you know what? I'm done. I'm going up there. I'm going to take care of this myself. Saul's finally going, man up. He kind of puffed his chest out a little bit. And he, was, he was finally going to go. Three times it happens. Saul goes up and as he goes, and you'll, you'll notice something different here again. As the messengers get to Naoth in Ramah, where the prophet is, where David is, they begin prophesying. The Lord begins using them and stirring in their hearts. 
They're, he's taken these guys' minds completely off of why they came. They're so drowned. They're, they're drowning in the Spirit of God right now, praising Him. But now when Saul's on his way, God starts working on him way before him getting to, to Naom. As he's going, he's still looking for David. The Spirit of God begins to fall upon him. And he even begins prophesying. Unlike the messengers of Saul. It's a whole different story here. God's Spirit gets a hold, get, gets a hold of Saul so greatly that our text says, He too stripped off his clothes and he prophesied before Samuel and lay naked all that day and all that night. Now, he may not have been but naked, okay? That word that's used there can be, word, it can be used in different ways. It doesn't necessarily mean all your clothes off in, in that desert heat on that hot sand. But what I think it really means is he may have just taken off his armor and his kingly vestments and he lay there in that state for 24 hours. Now you may be wondering, how is it that the Spirit of God, how, how can it even be possible that the Spirit of God comes down on Saul and he does all these things? He's a godless man, isn't he? He has proved himself godless and not afraid of God, not going to listen to God. Multiple times in the Bible, God and his providence has used wicked men to proclaim spiritual truth. We think of Balaam in the book of Numbers. King Balak asked for Balaam to curse the Israelites. And it's almost like Balaam goes, ah, 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 and he can't even curse. He begins blessing them. God's spirit came upon Balaam and brought those words forth from his mouth. Because Balaam's, a, Balaam's a, an idol worshiper. He's a pagan. Or what about Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 3? Check this out. You don't think godless men can sometimes be used of God to speak godly truth? Oh, they sure can. Daniel chapter 3. And look in verses, uh, let's see. Daniel chapter 3. Look at what, look at what he says. In verse, okay, there. Look at what he says towards the end of uh, chapter three, verse twenty-eight or twenty-six. The Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Came out from the fire. Look a little bit further down. Verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Who has sent his angel and delivered his servants. Who trusted in him. And set aside the king's command. And yielded up their bodies. Rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. He's giving praise to God right there. That, if that's not enough. Turn over to chapter 4 and look at verse 3. What does Nebuchadnezzar say there? How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. Look over in verse 34. <clears throat> when Nebuchadnezzar is restored, look at what he says in verse 34. I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him what you have done. He's given testimony of God's providence in his own life. Caiaphas in John chapter 11 even comes out and says, it says the Spirit of God came upon Caiaphas and he said that one man would die for the nation. Paul's testimony of some ministers in Philippians saying that they're just preaching Christ out of envy just to gain some money. So yeah, God can use whomever and whatever he wants to accomplish his sovereign will. By his providence. And believe me, Saul also is among the prophets. That may not necessarily be a compliment. I tend to believe, like some of the commentators, that it may have been just a jeer, a bar, because they knew that Saul was a wicked king. And how could he be in with the, with the men of the prophets? And again, 
we see God's providence in keeping his future king, David, safe. Right there in chapter 20, verse 1, look at what it says. Then David fled from Naoth and Ramah and came and said, and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is my guilt? God used these people in this place at this time so that David, by that providence, could escape Saul further. It was God's providence, God's spirit moving upon David, leading him to this place of refuge where he ultimately would be underneath God's prophet Samuel to receive strengthening and encouragement and guidance until he would leave there leaving Saul and all those who wanted to harm him behind. So, now, <clears throat> let's make it practical. Let's apply this. And, it, and it's good, because we want it to be more than just a story. We want what's taking place in chapter 19 to, just be, to be more than just a story in our heart or words that bounce around in, in this thing up here, this, this head of ours. Let me just ask you, because this, this is going to be a tough question. Do you believe in God's <clears throat> providence in your life, yes. in the life of, your, uh, of this world? Do you believe all this that happens to us every day, all that happens in our world, well, it's just luck, or it's chance, or coincidence, or karma, or good fortune, or bad fortune? Or do we have faith in God's providence working in our lives day by day, each little event, whether we think it is of little or great significance. That's a tough one. Every little thing, God has providentially worked out already. Stephen Curtis Chapman wrote a line in and his song, Take Another Step. And he says, we walk by faith and not by sight. We know it's true. We say it and sing it and love the way it sounds. Do we believe that? Do you truly believe that? Let's just ask ourselves some hard questions about God's providence in our lives. Do you believe he providentially put you in your place of employment. Man, I struggled with that one for years. Do you believe he has providentially placed you at that place with those people at this time for a specific purpose in his bigger picture? Do you believe that God has providentially put you in that long line at the deli counter? Or at the gas pumps? Or stuck in traffic? Do you believe God has, has providentially have you sitting in a doctor's office with other people who may be dying? Do you believe that God providentially has you sitting here, this one, in this place, better yet, the one that I struggle with, do you believe God is providential in our current political climate? Boy, we get fired up about that. I get fired up. Stop and think about it, though. Daniel says that he sets kings Amen. on their thrones and takes them off. Do you believe in God's providence today as Joe Biden... And Nancy Pelosi and Kamala Harris and every other politician, no matter whether they're Republican or Democrat or Independent, do you believe that God has providentially set them in that place for His glory and for His purpose? And the answer is a resounding yes. As much as we don't like it, as much as it just grates on us, God has put them there for His purpose because remember, He's working all things out for His glory. Not whether or not we like it or not, but what is going to ultimately 
<coughs> bring him the most glory. Are you hearing me? God is providentially working in our lives his sovereignty. And that's a hard nut to swallow. Some of y'all have been in some ugly, brutal, terrifying places in life. And it's hard to wrap your brain around God putting you in those places so that one day, somehow, some way, he is going to be glorified through your life and through your witness and through your testimony for Christ and what Christ has done for you. Do you believe God is working through providence in your life right now, this moment? His word tells us that God and his sovereignty is doing just that. Yeah. See, we go back to just before that other passage in Romans that I read. We go back to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know. And we know. Not we feel. Not my emotions are making me feel. No. <clears throat> At the bottom of the day, no matter what happens, we know that for those who love God, all things, all things, say it again, all things work together for good. But wait a second, let's add that last part on. We can't forget the last part. For those who are called according to his purpose. His providence today is putting us right there. I don't know about you, and I'm all, I can only say that God strikes me with cancer. It's his providence. He's working something big in my life. Bring it on. Pray that I can be strong. Yes. Amen. Pray that I can stand underneath the, 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 the terrifying symptoms and, and all that kind of stuff. Amen. Yes. Amen. But if that's God's providence in my life, who am I to argue with him? He is the God of all creation. He is the God who created me inside of my mother's womb. He is the God who providentially has brought me thus far in my life, immortal and untouchable, before the hosts of hell and the hosts of men. This verse promises me that. This verse reminds me of just that fact. <coughs> And that should be peace and comfort and strength into each one of our hearts. That should drive away fear and doubt, worry, anxiety. I'm one of the most anxiety-prone people you know. God is working out every event in world history for his honor and his glory. The good events and the bad events. He is working all things out in his providential way for the salvation of men, women, and children. Do you think people get saved by chance or luck? No. God puts preachers and people who are bearing the seed of God's word to them. He providentially places them into our lives. He places books in that random gospel track that's left in the right place or handed to a person at the perfect time for which God has planned to bring people to salvation. God's going to provident, providentially use each one of us believers in bringing salvation to someone else. Listen, that's your story. Everything that you've been through up until now, that's your story. That's your story of how God has providentially leaned into your life and worked things in you that you would never think is possible. But because of the people and the places and the perfect timing of his providence, he's getting glory from it in your life. We get so wrapped up in saying, why did God allow this? When we should be saying, how did God use this for his glory and the salvation of men? 
do you believe our Heavenly Father is good? Do you believe He's awesome? Do you believe He is fair? Do you believe He's just and merciful and gracious and kind and omniscient and omnipresent and omnipotent? Do you love Him and trust Him with your entire being this morning? Yes. If you do, then you can look behind you and tell the hounds of fear to be gone. You can shout out to the parasites of anxiety, away with you. You can cry aloud to the vipers of doubt, no more. Because God's providence is leading and directing you. And you are immortal and untouchable until then. Let me leave you with one last quote from Octavius Winslow. Let this sink deep into our hearts because I think we are all, are all guilty of what we would call practical atheism when it comes to God's providence. Beware of practical atheism, which excludes God from his own world. He is not only, which excludes God from, uh, let me start. Beware of practical atheism, which excludes God from his own world. Which excludes him from your own individual history. He is not only present in his created universe, but he is as much in personal events of life, shaping, guiding, overruling each and all. He's in control. It's providence that put each one of us here this morning. It's providence that will have us greet the people that we greet as we leave. Let me tell you another thing. It was God's plan foreordained in eternity's past that he providentially put those Roman soldiers at the cross that day. That he put those women at the cross that day. That Peter ran and hid. That John stayed at the cross. That Pilate was on the throne. That Herod was on his throne. It was providential that it happened in J Jerusalem. It was providential the time. Right down to the moment he took his last breath and said it is finished. So this is nothing, should be nothing that we stand in shock of. Because God was providential even in the crucifixion his own son and the men who were gathered that day there in that place the salvation was redeemed for us <clears throat> let's pray Father I just ask that you take your word and you stir in our hearts and you move in us let your spirit speak in a mighty way touch our hearts oh God like it's never been touched before draw us close to you we beg you oh God in Christ's name Amen